Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. If you have encounters of your own you'd like to share, check out the description box below, where you'll find the email sstorysubmissions at gmail.com, where you can send in your submissions to be read on the channel. You can also send in your fan emails. I love hearing from you guys. In Rockwood, in Rowan County, Tennessee, the closest water would have probably been Watts Bar Lake, and the nearest road may be Pump House Road nearby Highway 27. Sometime around midnight, my sister Alice heard dogs barking outside her windows. After going to bed and turning out the light, she was terrorized by heavy and powerful scream, like with all of its might. The sound was right outside her bedroom on the front porch. She was terrified and awoke her husband. They ran to their car and came to pick me up at my workplace about midnight. We drove back to their house and turned the car in the direction of the house. The headlights hit the basement door. Standing there at the door was a dark creature approximately six feet tall. It stood upright and turned and looked at us. It was not human. It was dark and appeared to be hairy and seemed to almost have no neck. It was not a bear. Its eyes were large and shiny. We three saw this. Similar sightings have been reported in this county. Rockwood lies in a valley below the Roosevelt and Cumberland Mountains. It is surrounded by lakes. We notified the police, but no report was filed, and we have told friends. On to the next one. In Giles County in Tennessee, a farmer watched a Bigfoot in a barn kill a calf by throwing it onto the ground. On to the next one. At Flintville in Lincoln County in Tennessee, a hairy humanoid that was seven feet tall with red eyes was seen. It stank and also wheezed like an asthmatic horse as it climbed a bank and was seen by two teenagers in an automobile at night. Three days later in Flintville, a hairy humanoid that was seven feet tall with red eyes and stank as well as wheezed like an asthmatic horse tried to abduct Gary Robertson, aged four, as he played in his backyard that evening. Miss Jeannie Robertson heard him cry out and rushed out to see a huge figure coming around the corner of the house. The creature was eight feet tall and covered in hair and reached out its long arms toward Gary, then came within a few inches of him before she grabbed and pulled him back. Miss Robertson had run to the door when she realized something was not quite right and saw a big black shape disappearing into the woods. Did the hairy humanoid want Gary as an adoption, a specimen, or as lunch? The following day in Flintville, a hairy humanoid that was seven feet tall, with red eyes, dank, and wheezed like an asthmatic horse, was chased down and cornered by a posse led by Deputy Sheriff Homer Davis, Melvin Roberts, Gary's father, and Stan Moore of Fayetteville. After it had absorbed about 40 rounds of gunfire, the beast tossed a barrage of boulders at the men and managed to slip away into the woods. Traces of miscus blood and hair were found the next day, along with 16-inch footprints. The hair was analyzed and did not belong to any known animal, though it had resemblances to human hair. On to the next one. In Lincoln County in Tennessee, 
a deputy sheriff sighted two large, hairy biped creatures by a wooded area as a domed disc-shaped craft hovered overhead. On to the next one. This is in Obion County in Tennessee. Well, this is going to sound strange, but here it goes. I grew up in a small community where something else lived. I have talked to people from that area from three generations that have seen this thing. If you have never seen it, most of the people that have won't tell you much. They don't want anyone to think they're crazy. I even knew one man who is dead now that had a relationship. He fed it and it was not afraid of him. Anyway, I've seen it three times during my childhood. One time from about 200 yards with two other people. The other two times I was alone. One of those times I was maybe 40 yards away coming home and it was in my backyard by a fence. But the last time was very intense. I was walking home from town about three miles away and it was pretty dark, so I was looking down most of the time. I was about a quarter of a mile from home and I turned onto the street that led to my house. I walked about 30 feet and there it was. It was about 10 feet in front of me. It was down on its hands and feet doing something. It saw me at the same time I saw it, stood up, and we looked at each other for a few seconds. It seemed like forever. Then it ran one way and I ran the other way. Now, we always called it the white thing. It looked like what most people think a Bigfoot looks like, except it is an off-white color. It is about eight to nine feet tall. My father always said all us kids were seeing things until he found tracks while hunting. I know about 30 to 40 people who have seen this thing. This area is mostly farmland now close to bottom land from the river. I have talked to people over three generations that have seen it over the years. The really strange thing is that it is white. I know 30 to 40 people that saw it at different times. One time, about 20 kids saw it at the same time. On to the next one. A friend and I were taking a hike on TVA land in Columbia, Tennessee. At that time, the area was deserted. My ex-father-in-law owned 20 acres that backed up to TVA, which met Duck River on the back. We were walking, and suddenly, 20 yards or less away, out of the bush, in wide open, there he was. We froze, and we all stared at each other. If he had been violent, you wouldn't hear the story. The Bigfoot turned, made an awful growling scream, and was gone. Later that day, my brother and I went back and searched only to find a four-inch tree about six feet up, freshly took and twisted to splinters. The farm was part of our area, and since the sighting, we were not scared when so many times we knew he was near. We were never attacked. It was midday on a perfectly sunny day. This creature and I were twenty yards eye to eye. On to the next one. My name is John, and my wife, Dawn, and I recently moved to Sherwood, Oregon. Since we are retired, we came here to help Dawn's sister care for their mother as she is alone now. We came up from Crescent City, California, where I retired from my fishing business, and hopefully in the coming years, we may migrate to Arizona, where we would like to live out our years without the gloom and rain. I should tell you first that we like to target practice, and on our first outing after moving here, we took our pistols and Don's father's old Jeep Wrangler and went into the ancient burn. After so many years after that devastating fire, the new growth trees have begun to dwarf the still standing spires 
of that horrendously devastating firestorm. Old-timers in the area say the smoke could be seen from 500 miles out to sea. Dawn's mother said that she vaguely remembered the red skies at night, as she and her family watched from their home over in Washington State. And you could hardly see in the daylight due to a solid blanket of smoke. Anyway, we followed the myriad of trails until we found exactly what I had hoped for, a road that led across an ancient logging bridge where I had to use the low-range 4x4 gear in order to climb the steep grade. And across the large planks of that ancient bridge, we doubted the road had seen much use over the years as there were no signs of tire tracks, but we had walked it first before crossing, so we felt safe enough after we crossed. We soon were following the old ruts that were almost completely gone, and small saplings began to beat against our narrow front bumper, until at dawn's urging, I finally quit smacking into them when the road we were on became quite narrow, and we were driving atop this narrow ridge line across what must have been a gorge with a stream rushing through it about 15 feet below the dirt track and then up onto another old bridge. This one was narrow but strong and as we made it across there was our ideal spot, a forested area that had sprouted in the midst of all the rotting timber and from that point on the entire area was beautiful as far as we could see. Thinking back to before we crossed that last bridge, we had no clue this area was here. It was like another world. One would never realize that there was a road anywhere nearby. It was no wonder it was so wild looking. Much of it must have escaped that fire. We made camp under some magnificent pine trees and after eating and relaxing, we broke out the arsenal, setting up targets at the base of a ridge further away across a meadow, where our expended bullets would hit into the side of the hill. We spent several hours just shooting at stones and weeds where we could initially see our hits and misses. With the absence of any nearby residences, we burned up ammo with abandon, not caring how long reloading them would take. Typical of shooters most everywhere, I left the piles of shotgun shells and the twenty-two caliber cases where they lay, which Dawn always frowned upon, but I got by with it. I think so anyway, but my bride has a way of somehow getting even for my tries at independence. Call it pent-up desire or just cabin fever, but out of one seven-day period, we day-camped on this spot five times. Then, after a couple of rainy days, after all, this is Oregon, we woke again with the sun and made a familiar way to our private retreat. When dawn made me stop just as we reached the point where I was about to make the downshift to a lower gear for the smooth climb over the bridge, she had me turn off the engine and on her way out, she beckoned me to follow, which, out of curiosity, I was anxious to see what she was up to. Dawn told me that something had been bothering her every time we came here, and today she finally figured it out. Pointing at the road up to the wooden bridge, she still had me confused, and then she walked back to the track behind the jeep and pointed, asking what I saw, to which I answered, track. Then, following her beckoning finger back to the road we were about to ascend, she pointed at the rut leading up to the bridge and asked my why, since it had only been a couple of days, and there was plenty of evidence behind the jeep of our repeated trip, why there were no tracks further than we were now parked. By then, we had reached the sand-covered planks crossing the creek, and as we continued walking across and down the other side, I could plainly see what I failed to notice before. On the far side of that wooden structure, there was absolutely no evidence of a tire track to be found anywhere. 
I must have been standing there with my mouth agape because Dawn told me to close my mouth. She had figured it out, and then she led the way to where we usually parked and ate, and our signs were all over the place, as well as a littering of brass cartridge cases. Then we put our heads together and concluded that someone or something had been only concerned with erasing our tracks. Then it became apparent that something or someone had erased all sign of our having come up the trail and to keep the secret of there ever being a bridge there. This made perfect sense as humans, but what sort of animal would have such intelligence? Then, as if nature wished to provide evidence to support the fact that we had maybe worn out our welcome, we sent that whoever or whatever had erased our signs must have done so for their own protection. Upon closer inspection on the walk back over the bridge, we were absolutely shocked when we saw a very large humanoid footprint in the wet sand where the creek passed under the wooden beams that held up the bulk of the bridge. At first, we were amazed at the size of the animal, and as our eyes followed the impressive tracks, we saw how serious these creatures had been. The main two supports that held up the heavy planks on the passenger side of the bridge had been somehow pushed off the base support beam below, and they were only holding up that entire side by about an inch of the very edge of the huge beam. We looked at each other, and Dawn began to tremble uncontrollably as we both concluded that, had we attempted to drive across, the weight of the jeep would have most certainly caused the small bridge to collapse. As we held each other, we were both trembling, and as we stood there, staring and trying to steady one another, off in the far distance, we both swore there were two large, human-like shapes staring back at us. Then I glanced over to see Dawn give a wide wave, and the creatures waved back. That really blew my mind, as I knew then I was looking at Sasquatch. As we drove back out of this area, I stopped several times to do my part in helping keep the secret by dragging a few dead trees onto the trail and rolling a few large rocks out on the ruts to really seal off that area so others won't be as unthinking as we had been. On to the next one. I was 16 when I ran into something strange in the woods, something that I'm still not positive was a Sasquatch, but I don't know what else it could have been. This happened out in the Catskill Mountains. For those of you who aren't familiar with the location, the Catskills are about 100 miles north of New York City. The place offers a broad range of outdoor activities for every season and is especially popular for skiing once winter rolls around. Back in the mid-90s, when I was a teenager, I was infatuated with dirt biking. My dad was nice enough to devote a small part of our nearly 40 acres of land to the construction of a makeshift motocross track. Even though he was worried about the possibility of me having an accident and becoming paralyzed, his lifelong support for my passion apparently conquered that fear. He's gone now, but I always think back about what a great time we had constructing that course together. It's without a doubt one of my most treasured father-son bonding memories. On the weekends, Dad and I would reevaluate the course and often come up with interesting ideas for additions. We extended the course so that there were areas where the track weaved in between sections of the forest. After landing from a ramp, you would approach a fork in the track that would give you the option of taking a detour into a heavily wooded section. We had two of those at different ends of the track, and one of those routes had a ramp of its own that was nested between rows of trees. It was really cool. It was a weekday afternoon in autumn when I had my encounter. 
I was out on the track by myself. My dad was at work, and my stepmom was inside the house, which, by the way, was a few acres from the track. You couldn't even see our house from that location. That's when it happened. I had literally just shot up the ramp in the forest when I suddenly made eye contact with the thing. Its torso was extended out from the foliage. It was almost as if it was beckoning for me to come closer. It had what I can only describe as an evil-looking grin on its face. Its mouth was open in a way that made it look like it was either snarling or growling, but I couldn't hear anything over the sound of my bike's motor. The way I had first seen this thing while I was gliding through the air was almost like one of those slow-motion theatrical moments. Of course, I had no choice other than to let gravity bring me closer to this creature that I was unable to identify. Within a split second, I had to decide whether I should break before I reached the creature and try to turn around or if it made more sense to maintain the bike's momentum and try to speed past it. I'm going to guess that the creature stood about 30 yards from the ramp. Therefore, I was forced to make a very quick decision. I gripped the bike with my legs as I twisted at the throttle. The noise from the engine grew louder and louder as I headed straight towards the creature. I watched as its head sort of withdrew back into its bulky shoulders in much the same way that turtles do when they're frightened. However, I should mention that I didn't get the impression that this creature was intimidated by me in the slightest. If anything, I felt that it was irritated by the sound of the bike. As I got closer to it, I became extremely worried that it was going to do something. Like what you sometimes hear mountain lions doing to unsuspecting bikelists. I had a strange feeling that it was going to pounce and knock me right off the bike. I was certain I would be knocked out cold if something as bulky as that creature were to do such a thing. It would have felt like being hit by a truck. I think I closed my eyes when I was only a few yards away from it, as there are a few seconds that I don't remember. However, I can't say for sure whether I did that because I was bracing myself for potential impact, or if it was simply because I was too scared to see the creature up so close. It was almost as if I was worried that doing so would be a bad omen or something. Fortunately, I managed to get past the creature with relative ease, and I don't think it even took a swipe at my bike. Another 10 to 15 seconds, I reemerged from the forest and back onto the main track. I didn't look back. I sometimes wish I would have glanced over my shoulder to get another look at the creature while I was between the trees, but I was going at such a high speed that I was afraid I may have lost my balance. If I had turned around, wiping out was obviously the last thing I wanted to risk at the time. I told my dad all about what had happened after he returned home that night. He wasn't the type to mock anyone, and even if he didn't fully believe me, I think he at least knew that I had seen something out of the ordinary. It was actually his idea that we install multiple trail cameras on and around the course. I guess he figured that whatever I had seen might return to the area. I went through a phase where I obsessively reviewed all the footage those cameras managed to capture, but unsurprisingly, I never had any luck in spotting anything unusual ever again. Eventually, I decided it was a lost cause and I fell out of the rhythm of checking. A few of the people I have told have asked me why I didn't think to go back to the exact location of where I had the sighting so I could see if the creature had left any footprints. The truth is damn simple. I was too scared. I remember almost laughing when being asked that question. Sure, 
it seemed like such common sense advice to someone who didn't experience the thing. Like I said, I have no way of knowing for sure whether what I thought was a Sasquatch or something else entirely, but I've spent a heck of a lot of time reading other people's stories. It seems like it's the most likely suspect. When someone asks me to describe its features, I tell them it had charcoal-colored hair and big hands that were the same color as Caucasian human hands. Its face was wide but flat and was mostly covered by hair. It also had abnormally large eye sockets. If I had never heard of Sasquatches before, I would have probably assumed this thing was a wolfman. And no, it was not someone wearing a costume, even though I was only able to see about half of it. That half alone was much too wide and bulky to have belonged to a human. That statement is honestly the quickest way to get under my skin. It's so damn ignorant in my mind. Anyhow, that's really all that happened. It's one of those things that kind of feels like unfinished business. I still feel like I'm owed more of an explanation to give my closure on what I experienced that day. It really makes me wonder how many of us are forced to accept that there are things we'll likely never get the answers to. That can be pretty tough to come to terms with at times. On to the next one. My experience happened all the way back when I was 19. I'm now 49 and the event is still rather difficult for me to talk about. It's something that I've avoided mentioning to almost everyone I've ever known. Sometimes you should come to terms with the fact that certain things in life don't make for great conversation. All some things do is lead people to think you're disturbed. I spent a considerable number of my young years in a small Oregon town known as Springfield. The place is connected to the town of Eugene, which is well known as the town that houses the University of Oregon. My family certainly wasn't wealthy, but both of my parents were avid outdoorsmen and brought my sisters and I up to be the same way. Before and after winter, we spent almost every single weekend either camping or hiking or both. Many of those trips led to some of my most prized memories, and I credit them for molding me into the person I am today. My parents reinforced the idea that it's the little things in life that make for a good one, and that money can only go so far in bringing happiness. Anyway, on my 19th birthday, my parents surprised me with what you would refer to today as a teardrop camper. If you don't know what that is, just imagine a two-person tent that's made of wood and aluminum that you can tow from the hitch of your vehicle. I was still going steady with my high school sweetheart, and I excitedly called her up to let her know that I wanted to invite her on what would be my first camping trip with the camper. She agreed, and I spent the next day driving all over the region, looking for a pristine location to serve as the first of what I hoped would be many journeys with the camper. This all happened during midsummer, so I was on the lookout for a way to relieve myself from the humidity. I remember I was in the Willamette National Forest, and within a mile radius from one end of a beautiful trail by the name of Fall Creek Trail. I found a secluded spot along a nearby river, and I was confident I had found a perfect location for me and my girl to camp the following weekend. I dropped trowel and waded into the refreshing river. The current was strong but manageable, and I can still recall that the water level came up to just below my armpit. From the water, I looked out onto the plot of land where I imagined us sitting beside the camper, looking up at the beautiful summer night sky. I dunked my head beneath the surface, and I was just 
planning on getting out to begin drying off in the sun. Suddenly, I noticed that someone else had entered the river from the opposite side. Because of the matted hair that flowed from the creature's head, my first reaction was that it was just an older hippie woman. I thought that maybe I had accidentally taken a dip in her regular spot. Without saying a word, she began to swim toward me using a frog kick motion. It didn't take very long for my heart to start racing. I noticed that it wasn't a person that was approaching me, at least not any kind of person that I had ever seen. I nearly gagged as I turned to face her. The most atrocious body odor that I had ever smelled filled my nostrils. To this day, it still ranks as the worst odor that I've ever experienced. I'll even go as far as to say I think it may have played a part in making my own swimming motion less efficient in that moment. Alone, the combination of being terrified while simultaneously gagging is something that I hope I will never have to deal with again, irrespective of whether it involves the mountain folk or not. As I frantically freestyle stroke my way toward land, I noticed that the breathing behind me was getting louder and louder. I didn't need to turn around to know that this strange lady was quickly gaining on me. I felt a hand brush the back of my calf a split second before my hand contacted the shoreline. Let me tell you, I didn't even know that my upper body was capable of such things, but I suddenly launched myself out of the water with the strength of my arms alone. I didn't even grab my trousers from the grass, and instead I made a beeline toward my truck. Since I had been able to see my truck from the water the whole time, I hadn't bothered to lock it. I was able to throw myself in through the passenger side door as soon as I reached the vehicle. I immediately locked the vehicle from the inside. I ducked down below the window for what felt like the longest time, as I was just too afraid to check to see if that woman was still nearby. Finally, the feeling of just wanting to get out of the area took charge, and I tilted my head up just enough to see the river. The strange-looking woman was fully out of the water and stood right beside the river. Her hunched-over body was covered from head to toe with very dark reddish-brown hair. The hair was dark and shiny, but the only reason I could tell that there was a red tint to it was because the very top of her head was still dry from not having been submerged in the river. My hunch that it was a female was confirmed by the fact that its breasts were fully visible and were hanging in much the same way that you will see on an adult female orangutan. She was just kind of looking toward the vehicle with these black eyes that, for whatever reason, reminded me of a horse's eyes. Then she looked to the left and then to the right as if she were scanning the area. Various parts of her body constantly twitched. I wondered if she was nervous about other people or more of her kind spotting her. She kept that same pattern of methodically looking around, going for a little bit before I finally lowered my head back below the window. There was something about looking directly at this thing that left me breathless. I guess it was probably because most of us tend to have such a powerful fear of the unknown. Eventually, I gathered the courage to take another peek. The hairy woman was gone. I thought I would have heard footsteps or a splash when she re-entered the water and swam off, but I heard nothing at all. She had vanished like a goat. I must have stayed locked in that vehicle for another 30 minutes at least before I heard another car pull up and park not too far from mine. I watched as a couple of fishermen began to unload their equipment from their vehicle. When I felt like I was out of their general line of sight, I worked up the courage to get out. I pretty much kicked the door open, sprinted outside to grab my clothes before I threw myself back through the passenger side door. As I drove off, 
I kept worrying that the hairy woman might run out across the road or randomly appear in the bed of my truck, but I made it back home without anything else happening. My parents could tell I wasn't acting like myself almost as soon as I walked through the door. Both my sisters were the overprotective type, and one of them kept pestering me, wanting to know why I seemed so nervous. I didn't know how to put what had happened into words, other than to say I was approached by this weird woman from the mountain. I didn't use the word Bigfoot in my description because I didn't think that this was what that creature was. I'd always kind of assumed that the creature known as Bigfoot looked like a smaller version of King Kong. Oregonians undoubtedly knew of Bigfoot back then, but the legendary creature was always described as having very different characteristics. The only attributes that were comparable in my mind were the monstrous size and, of course, the abundance of hair. I know it was stupid of me to let my fear get the best of me, but I ended up canceling the camping trip with my girlfriend and, unfortunately, lost pretty much all interest in camping, hiking, or really anything that involved immersing myself in the great outdoors. The encounter profoundly changed my view of the world, and I often wonder what things might have been like if I hadn't decided to swim in that part of the river that day. I like to say how reading other people's reports has been very helpful for me, even all these years after my encounter took place. On to the next one. When we were in our early 20s, my friend Rowdy and I went on somewhat of a backpacking binge. We had grown up together in the same neighborhood, a redneck area in Meeker, Colorado, and we'd learned to hunt and fish and do everything a good Western Colorado boy learned in those days. So we were pretty adept at taking care of ourselves. I say in those days because this was some 20 years ago, and we both grew up and went on to bigger things. Although I can't necessarily say better, Rowdy's now a pilot for a major airline, and I started a company that makes safety gear for miners. This incident I'm about to relate was what triggered us to get out of town and make something for ourselves, if you want to call it that. It definitely put an end to our backpacking. Rowdy and I had one thing in common. We both loved the outdoors. And I don't mean in a sense that would make one want to become a nature writer or a photographer, but more in the sense that we wanted to be wild men and never be indoors again in our lives, but instead go live in caves and explore and eat berries and all that. It was the freedom. Of course, it was a romantic notion based on watching TV shows about people like Ridley Adams and reading about the old-time trappers. Actually, now that I think of it, we were both kind of rebels, and the wilderness represented an escape from the convention and society for us. In any case, neither of us amounted to much by society standards. Rowdy worked at the local gas station, and I did odd janitorial work when I could get it. It was amazing. We'd both even managed to graduate high school. I know Rowdy was kicked out several times for smoking on the school ground, and I had my share of problems too. But we now lived for the times we could get out, and Rowdy finally bought an old beater pickup, which represented a major turn in things for us, as it meant we could finally get out and away. It was early summer when he bought the truck, and we both immediately quit our job. We planned on spending the entire summer exploring and backpacking. We both managed to save a little money, and we figured we could pull it off, then come back to civilization and get jobs again in the fall, unless, by some luck, we figured out a way to just live out there in the wild permanently. I think our parents were hoping for the latter by this time, as they pretty much had it with us. We had a great time that summer, exploring all over the place, 
and coming into town to resupply and say hello to our parents so they wouldn't worry too much. The memories we created during that short summer have stuck with me my whole life. And I know they're pretty special for Rowdy, too. We basically just went feral and lived like wild men. We had our health and our youth and our wild ideas, and it all went together into a very special time. Living out there in our little backpacking tent, hiking all over, and finding things we had no idea even existed, or things we had no idea existed finding us, I should say. It was late September, and we'd just come back up into the high country from town. Our packs topped out with fresh supplies. We knew it might be our last trip out, as it looked to be an early winter, with fresh snow already hitting the high country, though it had melted. All the outfitters were talking about how business was down, as people were thinking it was going to be a short autumn and all the deer and elk would be hightailing it into the low country, far from the hunters. Rowdy and I knew this because my uncle was an outfitter, Lone Joe Outfitting, North Fork of the White River. When he found out we were going out backpacking again, he warned us to get back within a week, as there was a storm brewing in the Arctic that looked like it was going to come down our way. He watched the weather more than most weathermen, and he'd also seen all the signs of an early and hard winter. He grew up in the back country, and I trusted his knowledge. So, for Rowdy and me, it was kind of a poignant time, as we knew it would probably be our last trip, which it was, but not for the reason we thought it would be. We were determined to go out with a bang, and planned our last outing as a seven-day backpacking trip across the Flat Top Mountains, not far from Meeker. My uncle told us we were nuts, as these mountains are pretty high in elevation, and he knew it was already freezing up there. But Rowdy and I were seasoned mountain men by then. Or so we thought. Actually, I didn't know what we were thinking. Maybe that if we got snowed in, we'd just end up like the old trappers, sitting around some big fire inside a make-do teepee with some good-looking Indian girls or something like that. Youth just doesn't know how to worry properly, I guess, and kids like us hadn't had the chance yet to find out all the things that can go wrong. We were going to start at Trapper's Lake, a beautiful large alpine lake right in the heart of the flat top, then pretty much hiked straight across the little town of Yampa, which sat on the other side of the mountain. Of course, there were a number of rugged peaks and cliffs that would prevent a straight line traverse, and we knew this, so my uncle had helped us plan out a trek that would take us up and through a number of drainages. The flat tops are named that for a reason. They're huge mesas capped with volcanic basalt, which give them their flat top and also create huge cliffs that ring the top, making it hard to get through them. So, we stuffed our packs to the gills and headed out, parking the truck at Trapper's Lake Lodge. The owners there knew my uncle well. We would hitch a ride back once we came out on the Yampa side. That was the plan, anyway. It was a good 40 miles or so, quite a hike, but we were young and strong and fearless and maybe a bit in denial, which is nicer than saying we were dumb. Oh man, the first few miles carrying a big pack always eat the man alive. After a while, you get your second win, and it slacks off, but the start is always hard. It takes a while for your blood to get oxygenated, but at first, it was easy, flat going as we circled the lake and we met a few people there who would all say hello and want to know where we were going. But one fellow we met on the trail left a bad taste in my mouth. He kind of took the wind out of my sails, though he didn't seem to bother Rowdy any. He was just a regular-looking sort of fellow, maybe in his forties, kind of shaggy with a short beard and longish hair. 
wearing a small pack and looking like he'd been out enough to know how to take care of himself. When we met him on the trail, he didn't even bother to say hello. He just stopped and started kind of lecturing us with concern. Look, boys, he said, you be real careful out there. As you probably know, there's been some big fires up here in the last few years, and you're going to be hiking through a lot of snags, you know, standing dead trees. They're very dangerous, and it takes almost nothing to knock one down. I had a couple almost come down on top of me out there on the trail just today. Try not to put your tents anywhere near them, as a night breeze will push them right down on top of you. We thanked him for his advice and started back up the trail, but he wasn't done. It's what he said next that left me feeling unsettled. And when you're the woodknockers, get the heck out. You're going smack into their territory, and you wouldn't be the first one to just disappear out there. Trust me on this one, kid. I stopped and turned, watching the hiker start back down the trail, seeming intent on making good time out. I just stood there for a while, wondering what he meant. Finally, Rowdy kind of hit my shoulder, saying, come on, let's get going. But I just stood there. I felt weird all of a sudden. The first time ever in my life, I questioned what I was doing. Rowdy said, woodknockers are just a myth. If they existed, we would have seen them by now, because we've been living in their supposed territory all summer. Come on. Don't let him scare you. Let's go. He's full of it. We continued on up the trail, but I was now more wary. Woodknockers. Bigfoot. There had been rumors of them in the flat top for years. In fact, I remembered a story my uncle told me about being out with some hunting clients, sitting around a campfire, and hearing the most ungodly scream that went on and on all night. After that, my uncle wouldn't go alone out in the mountain, even though he'd never seen anything remotely like a Bigfoot. He also knew some people who had come up on the other side of the mountain, over by Deep Creek, and found a weird assortment of clothes tossed around along the creek. As they were standing there, trying to figure it out, they saw a huge, dark figure come from the thick forest and just stand there, and they left immediately. These were stories I conveniently forgot when backpacking with Rowdy, until meeting the hiker that was. But we hadn't been in the flat top until now. Suddenly, my pack felt even heavier than before. I kind of thought for a moment about my mom's good crockpot stew and wondered if she'd made any lately. I hadn't thought about anything homey since we started our wild man lifestyle that spring. We carried on, right on up the trail and up the mountain. I swear, this was our last trip in and should have been the easiest because I was in top shape after a summer of backpacking. But it seemed harder and harder the further we got. I finally mentioned it to Rowdy. He answered, it's just cause you're feeling uncertain from what that hippie looking dude told you. That's all. You have to rekindle the charge. I didn't say much and just followed Rowdy on upward. I was thinking that a big crate of dynamite would be about the right charge to get me rekindled. Not much else would have any effect. We found a nice place to camp for the night in a beautiful clearing by a little pond, surrounded by old, narrow-leaf cottonwood trees, not a snag in sight. I was so tired I slept like a rock, if rocks can sleep, and Bigfoot never crossed my mind. The next day, I was re-energized, and so was Rowdy. Our old enthusiasm was back, and we made good time, hiking up a long drainage and finding a way onto the top of a huge mesa. The views were awesome. We decided to try and make good time and get back down on the other side before dark, which we managed to do with a lot of effort. We both slept like babies that night, forgetting all about woodknockers. The next day, our third day in, we climbed up another drainage, which was tough going, as there weren't many animal trails 
and we had to fight our way through scrub oak underbrush. When we got on top, we could see what looked to be the leading edge of a storm way out far to the west, and I can't say this made either of us very happy. We were now in the heart of the flat-topped wilderness. Our mountain man romanticism was quickly settling into reality of pure physical survival in the high mountain. We were at 10,000 feet. Once again, we made good time. Unlike our previous trips, we both now felt a sense of urgency, and I could tell the barometric pressure was dropping. I'd been out enough to recognize how the dropping pressure affected me, and this felt like a big one coming in. Why we didn't just turn around when we saw the storm coming in, I'll never know. The next day, our fourth, we woke to overcast skies and a scent of foreboding. Gray thendrils of cloud melted around the mountaintops above us. We broke camp with an even greater sense of urgency. It really felt like snow was coming. There was that cold clamminess to the air that usually preceded a big snowfall. And the air smelled different, like it always does before a big storm. We packed up again, took a few minutes to study our topography map, then headed out. We needed to make good time, as we had many miles to go before we were even vaguely near civilization. I was beginning to wish I'd listened to my uncle. The day wore on as we slogged along. Finally, it was getting late. So we started looking for a place to set up camp, just like the hiker had said. We were now in a huge snag forest, and tall dead pines stood all around like ghostly sentinels. As darkness fell, their dead bark took on an eerie aspect from the setting sun, muted behind the thick cloud. We looked and looked, but we couldn't find anywhere to camp where there weren't snags. As it was as close to dark as we could get and still see to set up our tent, and we had to stop. I was exhausted, but Rowdy acted like he could hike all night. In fact, he suggested we do just that, since he didn't want to camp in the snag. In a former lifetime, the one before I met the shaggy hiker by Trapper's Lake, I might have agreed to do that, but not now. I was just too tired and on edge and I didn't want to chant getting lost. I told Rowdy we'd just have to take our chances with dying from deadfall. He said it was an interesting play on word, then reluctantly took off his pack. We set up the tent in a thinner part of the forest, but we were still surrounded by dead pine. Some stood 30 or 40 feet tall. We could see where a number had already fallen. I pretty much collapsed into my sleeping bag so tired I didn't even want dinner. I don't remember much except waking once to the eerie sound of trees creaking and seeing long shadows across my tent. I woke at dawn to a distant sound that sounded like a tree crashing to the ground, then went back to sleep. It wasn't until Rowdy woke me with a cup of coffee that I really came around. I drank it while still in my bag, then mustered the energy to get up. It was cold, and I could see my breath. Rowdy already had his tent down and pack ready, though it was still early. He seemed unusually quiet and eager to get going. He made more hot coffee and some hot oatmeal while I broke camp. It was now totally gray and dreary, speaking to the leading edge of a huge storm. What's up, bud? I asked. Rowdy usually lounged around camp until I made the push to go. Nothing. I just feel like we need to get going. Anything in particular? The weather, among other things, he answered. He pointed to a dusting of fresh snow on the cliffs above us. I asked, what other thing? Rowdy was quiet for a while, then asked, didn't you hear the noises last night? I heard the snags creaking, that's all. Wood knocking. He replied quietly. Holy crap, I said. Are you sure? Yep. For a long time. They got closer and closer. There were at least three of them, all in different directions. 
I'm thinking we need to turn around and go back now. What? We're way over halfway now, I replied. Yeah, but we know the way back. The way forward is unknown. We can make better time if we turn around. Rowdy was scared, and so was I, but we needed to push forward, not turn around, especially with the storm. We were only a day or two at the most from our destination. I answered, you're wanting the security of the known, but we're not that far out now. We have to go forward. If we go back, we'll run out of supplies, and we'd have to keep really close bearings as things always look different when you're hiking the opposite direction. We can't make enough faster time to justify it. We both sat there a while, uncertain of what to do. It now started to drizzle, a cold rain that felt like ice. Rowdy added, if we go forward, we still have to cross the Devil's Causeway, though we'll come out sooner. But the causeway will be the real bear if it's snowing or ice covered. It's scary enough when it's dry. The Devil's Causeway was part of the Chinese Wall, a huge volcanic dike we would have to hike across at an altitude of almost 12,000 feet. The Chinese Wall was about 200 feet wide. But the Devil's Causeway portion was very exposed and narrow, a mere three feet across for about 20 feet and 400 sheer feet down on either side. We had both hiked it from the other side when we were in high school. It was very rocky and difficult under the best of condition, and we'd seen seasoned hikers power and turn around because of the exposure. The views were like being in an airplane. Of course, there would be no views in the storm. I suspected that we would be in a full-out blizzard by the time we got to the Chinese Wall, and I knew Rowdy suspected the same, but neither of us said a word. We both stood, put on our packs, and started down the trail going forward. It was now fleeting and cold, and the trail was slippery. We had good coats, but we both felt chilled to the bone from the damp. After a couple of hours, we stopped to make hot chocolate. As we sat there, boiling water in our little backpacking stove, I heard it. Wood knocking, just like Rowdy had said, and not so far away. I felt even more chill. The hiker's words, You wouldn't be the first one to just disappear out there, kept running through my mind. Rowdy had heard it too. We quickly drank the hot chocolate and headed out, our walking gait turning into a half jog, even though it was wet and slick. We found some large sticks and used them to help keep our balance. Soon it was dusk. We'd made good time and had to be close to the Chinese wall. The wet drizzle was now turning into snow, and I had another first in my life. For the first time, I thought I could die out there in the wilderness. It occurred to me how truly easy it would be, which I think fueled some sort of survival instinct, as I told Rowdy we were going to try our hand at night hiking and hope we didn't get lost. He agreed it was a swell idea. We'd hike by headlamp until we got to the Chinese wall, then regroup. Pure insanity, but we were both chilled to the bone at the thought of spending a night in camp surrounded by woodknockers. We picked up the pace, but as it became dark, we stopped long enough to eat a hot dinner. We both knew it was the smart thing to do, as our bodies needed fuel and warmth to continue on. I could see both of us wandering, lost, hypothermic in a blizzard, and it seemed to be a prophetic vision at this point. As we sat there, eating freeze-dried stew and drinking hot tea, the wind picked up, and the forest began to creep. We were in more snag, and the storm was now moving in full brunt. Just then, what sounded like a huge tree came crashing to the ground not more than twenty feet from us. So close, we were both barraged by small branches that snapped off from the impact. Time to go. We slogged on in the dark, following somewhat of a trail through the tall grasses and trees, and finally, at what I guessed to be about 2 a.m., 
we reached some rocky rubble, what I suspected to be the beginnings of a talus slope. If so, this was the trail up the Chinese wall, and would soon become a steep and treacherous rocky climb. We had to stop. We couldn't navigate this in the dark, and we needed to rest. We were both exhausted. We were at the edge of another snag forest, so we began collecting wood. We would try to rest and get warm around a big fire. It was still fleeting and thus difficult to find dry wood, but we knew if we got the fire going hot enough, even damp wood would burn. We soon had a huge pile of wood from the nearby forest, enough to build a big bonfire. We didn't even bother to put up our tent, but instead draped them over us to keep us dry, laying our sleeping bags next to the fire, which raged and helped warm us up. We decided to take turns keeping the fire going, as the last thing we wanted was for it to go out. I knew Rowdy was exhausted, so I offered to stand first watch. I also figured the odds were better of the fire being fed if I stayed up and let him sleep, as I didn't trust him to stay awake. To make a long story short, I fell asleep myself, and the fire went out. I woke some time later with a start, as something had made my instinct kick in. I lay there very still and could soon hear a large animal pacing back and forth in the darkness, not far away, crashing through the brush and snapping sticks. It seemed unhappy that we were here. Just then, something whizzed by my head, something big, which then crashed into the grasses behind us. I jumped up and quickly got the fire again. The woodknockers had followed us. I knew it was them. What else could throw something like that? Whoosh! Another snag came flying through the air, a big one. It almost landed in the fire. I started yelling and cussing, both from fright and anger. We'd finally almost made it out, and now these creatures were going to kill us. Death by deadfall, except it didn't fall. No one would believe it. Death by snag missile? What a way to go. Now, Rowdy was up next to the fire, scared to death, chilled and teeth chattering. Wham! Another tree came in, but not quite as close. These creatures must be huge and strong to throw something like a snag. The thought of all this made me want to start crying. All the stress and physical exhaustion of the past few days had taken their toll. I started yelling again at the top of my lungs. I had no idea what time of night it was, but dawn couldn't be too far off. All of a sudden, what I heard made my teeth start chattering, along with Rowdy's. It was a blood-curdling scream like nothing on this planet. It sounded angry and like it wanted to kill us, and it went on and on at a volume that defied all reason. Echoing through the cliff, and on and on into the deep thickness of the forest behind us. I knew we were dead then and there. In fact, I took Rowdy and I put an arm around his shoulder. I could feel his chest heaving, and I knew he was silently sobbing. I softly told him, Whatever happens, bro, we're going to get through this. You watch. We're sons of guns, and we're survivors. What I really wanted to say was, Goodbye. See you on the other side but I didn't want to make him worse. The screaming had dissolved like a huge ocean wave slams the shore and gradually dissipates. But the weird feeling it left behind really messed with my mind. I just couldn't believe this was happening. We have to go now, I told Rowdy. Let's leave the fire burning as a decoy and see if we can slip away. It's got to be near dawn. If we can get across the Chinese wall, Maybe they'll leave us alone. Why would that matter, Rowdy asked. Territory, I answered. Although I didn't believe it myself. Besides, better to die fighting than huddled by a fire. We banked the fire as high as we could, grabbed our packs and slipped off. Snow sizzled into the fire behind us. It was really starting to come down now. I seriously doubted we could get out, even without wood knockers to distract us. We stopped, and I shone my light ahead. The falling snow made it difficult to tell, but I had been right. 
we were at the base of the Chinese wall, the beginning of a talus slope that I knew was steep and unstable. It would be twice as tricky with snow on it. We started climbing, wondering if the wood knockers were behind. I knew they were. We carefully made our way upward as dawn broke. I was glad to see the light as I knew that even if we could get up the talus slope, traversing the actual Chinese wall in the dark would be dangerous as one had to stay in the middle it was a sheer drop off on either side, although wide. But when it narrowed to a meter, three feet at the Devil's Causeway, it would be pure suicide in the dark and ice. It was now snowing hard, and the wind whipped it into swirling cloud, howling, and I sometimes thought I could hear a wood knocker scream through it. Visibility was poor in the dawning light, but we just climbed up and up until we reached the top and it began to level out. We were now on the actual Chinese wall. We stopped to catch our breath and knock the snow off our pack, but we didn't stop for long. Rowdy, I whispered. There's something coming up behind us. Gotta go fast now. I grabbed his arm and pulled him along, half running, half flipping. I could hear footsteps behind us. A heavy, pounding sound like something big, when the wind quit whistling and whipping our coat long enough to hear anything. I was terrified. We both ran as fast as we could, sliding along, and fortunately, we could now see well enough to stay in the middle of the wall. I didn't dare turn around to see what seemed to be rapidly catching up to us. We were now at the narrow nightmare called the Devil's Causeway. Rowdy stopped, frozen in fear. The twenty-foot catwalk was covered with several inches of snow. Rubbly rock made the going hazardous enough without adding snow, and the visibility was poor. But we could still see the sheer drop-off on both sides. The wind seemed to be worse, and I figured it was because of the narrowness here. It was coming straight up from either side and meeting in the middle. I now began to think, the wind was more of a danger to us than the snow, as it would mess with our balance and whip us right off. Go, Rowdy, go, I screamed. I had now turned around just enough to see something huge and black behind us, although I couldn't make out what it was because of the blinding snow. But Rowdy stood frozen. We could now hear the wood knockers making grunting noises, and it was quickly gaining on us. We had to act fast. Ditch your pack, I screamed into the wind, throwing my heavy pack into the abyss below. Rowdy quickly did the same. It would make the crossing easier. We might regret not having our survival gear, but not as much as we would regret falling. I hooked my arm through Rowdy's, and we quickly yet deliberately walked across, not daring to look down. At one point, I could feel myself starting to slip, but he grabbed me, and I miraculously recovered. It was the longest twenty feet of my life. The wind nearly blew us off, but I think we had more stability because we were hanging onto each other for dear life. Finally, we were across. I turned, scared to death at what I knew I would see, then stunned by what I actually did see. Something big was coming across the causeway, not more than thirty feet from us. Rowdy thought and began yelling something unintelligible. We should have both started running, but we were frozen in fear, literally. It was hard to make out its features through the thick snowfall, but we both knew it was a wood knocker, a Bigfoot. But the creature hadn't gone more than a few feet across when an especially strong gust of wind hit it and it started to lose its footing. We watched in horror as it balanced for a moment and then, seemingly in slow motion, began falling off the side, its last movement a horrible grasping at the rock with its long arm flailing. It let out a long, terrifying scream as it fell, and to think of it takes my breath away even to this day. And what happened next I also couldn't believe. We heard gunshots. Someone was on the Chinese wall, not far ahead of us, shooting what sounded like a rifle. The shot 
popped and the sound echoed back and forth. Someone was nearby. Rowdy and I both started yelling at the top of our lungs. We yelled and yelled until we thought we would go forth. We yelled as we hightailed it down the far side of the Chinese wall. We wanted whoever it was to find us. We soon saw two figures through the wind-whipped snow. It was now a full-on blizzard. How they found us, I'll never know. But it was my Uncle Joe and Rowdy stepdad. They'd come looking for us. They had a base camp set up not too far away, complete with horses and food. They hoped to meet us on our way out, and came as soon as my uncle realized what was really coming in, weather-wise. He'd fortunately helped us plot our route, so he had an idea of where we would be. He had watched the forecast like a hawk, and when he realized how huge a storm was coming in, he knew we would need help. We were never happier to see another human being. We returned to camp, got warmed up, ate a hot meal, then headed out on horses, making good time. Riding never felt so good, even though I was sore for days afterward. We later found out the high flat top got six feet of snow from that storm. Our mountain man days were over, forever. It was a few years later that Rowdy and I decided to get my uncle to ride in with us to check it all out. He brought horses, and we came in from the Yampa side along the base of the Chinese wall, right to where we could look up and see the Devil's Causeway. Even though it was a warm summer day, I could still feel the chill of that early morning, high up there in the blizzard, holding on to Rowdy and watching the woodknocker scream as it fell. I found only one thing from our pack, and it was the tin cup I had carried that said Lone Joe's outfitting. There was otherwise no trace of anything. I knew we'd thrown our packs off that side, so it was kind of weird. We looked around a bit for bones, but never found any. It seems we all got the creep at the same time, because everyone decided to turn around and go back, instead of having the picnic lunch we'd brought along. We rode back, loaded up the horses, and had a nice dinner at the Antlers Bar in Yampa, then went on back to Meeker. If you have encounters of your own you'd like to share, check out the description box below, where you'll find the email sstorysubmissions at gmail.com, where you can send in your submissions to be read on the channel. You can also send in your fan emails. I love hearing from you guys. I hope you enjoyed those encounters. And if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day. So be sure to hit that notification bell, and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much. And until next time, bye!